Hello, my name is Dr. Michelle Mead and I am the director of the IDEAL RRTC. Hello and welcome to this, uh, our inaugural webinar, Aging with Cerebral Palsy, Health Outcomes and Management. The IDEAL RRTC stands for Investigating Disability Factors and Promoting Environmental Access for Healthy Living Rehabilitation Research and Training Center. We are funded by the National Institute of Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research within the Administration on, on Community Living in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Our focus is to promote healthy aging for people with long-term physical disabilities. We conduct activities to generate new research-based knowledge by first identifying the specific interactions between or combinations of personal and environmental factors that are associated with better health and functioning outcomes for individuals with long-term physical disabilities. We then use that information to develop evidence-based interventions and knowledge translation activities. This webinar series is part of those knowledge translation activities and is being developed with the overall goal of enhancing the capacity of all stakeholders to understand and promote healthy aging for adults with disabilities. With these webinars, um, we will have quarterly sessions which will rotate between four different focus areas. First, research findings from our center, such as this seminar. Uh, second, policy issues and updates relevant to disability and health issues. Third, clinical best practices for working with adults aging with physical disability. And fourth, sessions focused on research, methodology, issues, resources, and discussions. I want to thank our colleagues at ICPSR for hosting the series and those at the ARC for working with us to support and highlight this important topic. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, our, one of our partners and representatives from the ARC, Ms. Jenny Alexander. Good afternoon. My name is Jenny Alexander, and I am the Director of National Initiatives at the ARC of the United States. I am thrilled to be here today as a partner of the IDEAL RRTC. The mission of the ARC is to promote and protect the human rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, including people with cerebral palsy, and to actively support their full inclusion and participation over the course of their lives. We are the largest provider of advocacy, supports, and services for people with IDD and their families and our network of over 600 chapters serve more than 1 million people annually. Our network provides services across the lifespan, including to older adults who are experiencing the unique challenges of aging with IDD, and to the families that include older caregivers who may themselves be aging into disabilities. One of our most recent efforts to support people with IDD who are aging is our Center for Future Planning. The Center for Future Planning provides reliable information and assistance to individuals with IDD, their family members and friends, professionals who support them, and other members of the community on areas such as person-centered planning, decision-making, housing options, and financial planning. You can find us online at futureplanning.thearc.org. One key area that the center focuses on is planning around healthcare needs and healthcare decision making as people age. Our webinar today discusses aging issues for adults with cerebral palsy who are more likely to experience secondary conditions and negative health outcomes as they get older. Our expert panelists will share their research as well as practical steps that adults with cerebral palsy, families, and advocates and healthcare providers can take to help adults manage their health. We are thrilled to be here today and support this important topic. Without any further ado, we want to introduce our panelists and let them share their expertise with us. Dr. Mark Peterson is an associate professor in the University of Michigan Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and an active member at the University of Michigan Neuroscience Graduate Program, the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation, the Michigan Center 
on Demography of Aging and the Michigan Institutes for Data Science. Dr. Heidi Hapala is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Michigan Medical at the University of Michigan. She is also on staff as an attending physician with the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the Veterans Administration Medical Center in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Mark and Heidi, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you. This is Heidi Hapala talking. So today we will be covering um, issues related to aging with cerebral palsy. I'm a physician in, at the university who sees adults with cerebral palsy and works in the adult cerebral palsy clinic. So many of the issues that I have seen in clinic, we are have translated into research and back into clinic. Some of the issues we'll talk about today are clinical insights regarding obesity, functional loss, pain, and chronic disease. We'll talk about clinical management of age-related diseases, uh, research that we have done pertaining to physical and psychological morbidity and multimorbidity in cerebral palsy, and also address some health behaviors to improve the health and prevent disease across the lifespan. And at the end, we will hopefully leave some time for some questions. So when we talk about aging with disability, we um, have used cerebral palsy as a model. Cerebral palsy is the most common childhood onset physical disability. It's a primary condition that is non-progressive as far as the original injury. The lifespan is normal for most adults who are less affected. And at this point in time, we estimate there's about 500,000 adults with cerebral palsy living in the United States. As children with uh, cerebral palsy become adults, they start to notice some new problems. And in the clinic, we have often seen this. Patients will come in and they'll have concerns related to a functional decline at an early age, often in their 20s, 30s, or 40s. Uh, and they have questions about what might be causing this decline. There may be some secondary factors, such as de decreased uh, aerobic capacity, decreased fitness, musculoskeletal dysfunction, such as spasticity, muscle weakness, uh, pain, which is a very common cause for many of our adults with cerebral palsy, and fatigue. In addition, there are mental health issues, and we have a lot of new research looking into mental health issues in adults with cerebral palsy. What do adults with CP want to know? One of our patients brought up that his, my biggest challenge is understanding what is happening within my body. It appears that over the last couple of years, my muscle has deteriorated. I expected some deterioration, but not quite this early. I would like to know if this is reversible or how much it will worsen. And this is a question that we see in some form or another with many of our patients that present to clinic. SB is a patient who is 25 years old. She is moderately affected with cerebral palsy. She has had issues with uh, struggling with obesity. On testing, she has had issues with low bone density and high cholesterol. She uses a walker for mobility and as a result has had a lot of issues with musculoskeletal pain in her shoulders, wrists, hips, and feet. She has had a lot of issues with fatigue and has had, uh, which has affected her ability to participate in uh, everyday activities and in the community. We have talked about power mobility in the clinic and she feels like this might be a failure. Another example of a patient that has shown up in clinic is somebody, a 43 year old man who has mildly affected uh, with a GMFCS level one or functional level where he walks without any assisted device. He actually participated in military service and made it into the Navy. He had always had high fitness levels and worked out with the SEALs. However, as he got older, he noted that he had issues with fatigue and was less able to participate. He had a normal BMI, but when we looked at other measurements, uh, which we will probably will discuss later, his waist circumference in relation to his hip rate of circumference was high, which is an indicator for risk for cardiovascular disease. He also had a high cholesterol and his the good cholesterol level, his HDL was low. He also reported issues with sleep. 
And this is a uh, picture of a DEXA scan on one of uh, our patients. The interesting thing that we wanted to talk about here is this is a patient who fits in at the bottom of the screen here. You can see that we talk, this is the body mass index. So he had a normal body mass index um, with, at the range of less than 25. But when we looked at his percent body fat, he was in the 90th percentile for his age. So despite the fact that he has a normal body mass index, he was had issues with over, over fatness or adiposity. So some of the questions that we thought about in, in clinic and wanted to know more about was what are the issues that will raise the concerns and, and accelerate this concern about aging and functional loss for our patients with cerebral palsy. So knowledge is power. We wanted to talk about uh, setting a research agenda for cerebral palsy, looking at some of these longitudinal studies focusing on outcomes with aging, looking into what can we make recommendations ago about regarding exercise, fitness, and risk of chronic disease for people with cerebral palsy. Thank you, Heidi. This is Mark Peterson. Um, I always start this first slide because I, I think it, it shows basically how I feel about BMI. Uh, Dr. Hoppala just mentioned the fact that BMI may not be a good indicator for individuals with CP. And it turns out that basically because it's a one compartment model that takes only into consideration height and body mass, we know nothing about the patient's uh, or subject's uh, body composition. So very much like a glacier, we see something on the surface is poorly represents what is under the surface. And so um, starting to really advocate for the uptake of using waist circumference or waist to hip ratio in our population. And two trendy terms, which are probably no longer trendy, uh, normal weight obesity and metabolically healthy obese. Essentially, we're worried in our patient populations is not specific just to CP, but I, I would posit that any frailty phenotype is that anyone who comes in at normal weight and yet has high adiposity is at high risk for uh, chronic disease, specifically cardiometabolic diseases. A study we did a few years ago in older adults from the general population shows this quite nicely. Um, the CDC drives around uh, occasionally and does, uh, in the in-hand study, we'll do actual in-home or outside of the home, but right with a, with a mobile unit, that DEXA scan. And um, we can determine somebody's body composition on the basis of full body DEXA. And so with this, you can see in over older adults, um, BMI of 30 is what we consider to be obese. Uh, for all intents and purposes. And if we use body composition or fat percentage, 35% for women and 25% for men is considered to be elevated or increased adiposity uh, representing obesity. So basically showing this slide is nothing to do with cerebral palsy. It has to do with the fact that the diagnostic accuracy of BMI is very, very poor to begin with in the general older adult population. Um, and it stands to reason in my mind, and for most of us, I think, we believe that BMI is a poor metric to determine adiposity uh, or obesity risk in the CP population. So what happens under the surface isn't just about adiposity in the subcutaneous depot, but we know that with age, there is decreases in muscle mass in the general population, and there's also an increased adiposity deposition in not just the, the um, the subcutaneous depot, but also the intramuscular depot. So fat becomes infiltrated in the muscle itself, uh, which is a risk factor for, for uh, cardiometabolic disease, specifically insulin resistance. Uh, it happens as features of also other disease processes like type 2 diabetes. It happens very rapidly after spinal cord injury. It happens in older adults who experience sarcopenia and sarcopenic obesity, and it happens with general obesity, as well as very very important to this lecture and for our patients who are highly sedentary, it happens with prolonged sedentary behavior. So it's not just a factor of aging and obesity, 
uh, a study published in 2009, the first study published, I should say, uh, was published in 2009 that looked at uh, children with quadriplegic CP and found that they had significantly increased intramuscular adipose tissue as compared to typically developed matched peers. Um, you can see by uh, this imaging on the top is a child with cerebral palsy, and then on the bottom is a matched control child. And very clearly, the muscle mass is, is a major problem. There's much, much smaller muscle um, in, in the child with CP uh, and much greater fat in the, the subcutaneous depot. But there's also, if you look after this, this depot has been stripped away, there's much more uh, fat within the muscle itself, both inter and intramuscular fat. So this puts the child at risk for, um, for again, for early onset uh, cardiometabolic disease. And also th these findings were found to be uh, highly associated with physical activity participation. So those individuals with less activity had greater fat store in the muscle. A colleague of mine, Dr. Daniel Whitney, did this work during graduate school and found not only does uh, fat uh, uh, emerge on, in children with cerebral palsy, and these are highly functioning children with cerebral palsy, uh, around in, in the muscle, but also in the bone marrow space. And so they were able to find for the first time in this, this patient population that bone marrow is actually another depot with which fat seems to be accumulating. And uh, he is now at the University of Michigan working in our group and doing some really excellent work to extend this, to try to understand the mechanism of frailty and CP from the standpoint of adipose tissue. Okay, so, but what we're here to talk to you uh, today about is what happens in adults with cerebral palsy. And so, what happens to children, adolescents, and young adults with CP as they transition throughout adulthood? What we hear from our clinical colleagues um, is that they experience accelerated aging. They have premature aging, they have premature frailty, they may be again at normal weight obesity risk, and they have very, very high, ex uh, highly exaggerated sedentariness. So for the last about 10 years now, the focus of my work is to try to understand the natural history of CP. And so everybody is aging and there's obviously a risk for obesity. So anything that affects um, individuals with CP from the context of aging um, is of interest to me. Um, and so we have to do a better job, I feel, and have really started to do that um, to improve the, the knowledge base to what happens across the lifespan for individuals with CP and how can we improve um, but not just uh, life expectancy, but healthy life expectancy. So one of the first studies that we did a few years back was to look at um, body composition from the standpoint of imaging in adults with CP. And so we want to look at both muscle and bone quality in adults with cerebral palsy. And using um, computer tomography, we imaged individuals if we took images from individuals at the L4 level and were able to calculate density and, and, and size of muscle and fat stores. And the picture on the left is a uh, typically developed individual and the picture on the right is a 54 year old male with CP 66 kilograms body mass. So by no means an obese individual, but you can see the dark shaded region in the, the subcutaneous area, but also the intra-abdominal area significantly greater among for the man with CP. And not only that, but the muscle and the psoas muscle and the erector spinae muscle, much, much smaller and also less dense. What we found essentially was that adults with CP had significantly less psoas muscle cross-sectional area. They had lower muscle attenuation coefficients, so their muscles were filled, uh, filled, they had significantly greater fat store, so lower density of muscle. And of course, to no surprise to anybody, they also had lower density of bone. So their trabecular and cortical bone densities were lower than the um, individuals without CP. So the critical clinical question that we began to ask, especially when we uh, visit the American Academy of CP every year and our colleagues around the country and world was that given the documented loss or absence of lean body mass, both muscle and bone and increased storage of visceral and muscle adipose tissue, is there an increased risk for chronic disease? At the time, there was no studies on adults with CP from the standpoint of health outcomes. Um, nobody really was doing much work in the area, and there had been not a single study published on that topic. And so 
we began to work with a health economist because there was very little data available, um, national or international data, and there certainly isn't, wasn't at the time any registry data um, about health outcomes in individuals with CP. And so we looked at the medical expenditure panel survey as a source of data, which is a really rich source of data used mostly by health economists, but using ICD-9 codes, we're able to categorize individuals and build a cohort of individuals, adults with CP, and then also look at disease risk factors such as diabetes, asthma, hypertension, other heart problems, stroke, emphysema, joint pain, and arthritis. And to no surprise to us, I think it was a bit of a surprise just in general, there was a large increased risk for um, all of these outcomes in the adults with CP as compared to individuals without CP. And so this was published a few years ago. Um, and that was one of our first studies that, that really kind of instigated this work um, and, and kind of hopefully instigated work uh, in others around to, to start looking at this uh, issue in their adult patient population. Some of the other significant covariates of that study were, no surprisingly, age, obesity, degree of physical disability as self-reported activities of daily living limitations, uh, and then physical inactivity, whether individuals met or did not meet recommendation for physical activity participation. So we decided at the University of Michigan to build a cohort of adults with CP based on our clinical registry and using electronic medical records, we were able to do that to look at to what extent is multimorbidity, the presence of two or more chronic diseases, um, a problem in our patient population at the University of Michigan? Um, and we wanted to know among middle-aged adults with CP, is there an issue with regard to chronic multimorbidity? Multimorbidity is in, in um, just the general population considered to be a major problem in the older adult population. And so if there is indeed evidence of early aging in CP, we would expect to see a higher prevalence of multimorbidity in our middle-aged adults with CP. So you can see the chronic conditions that we looked at um, among multiple organ systems, essentially, wanting to know if there was an issue related to multimorbidity. And we did not have a control group. This is simply looking at just adults with CP, to what extent is multimorbidity prevalent? And what we found was that not only is there an issue of multimorbidity, but it is extremely highly prevalent in middle-aged adults with CP. In the bar graph that you see, we have broken it out by both two different things, GMFCS 1s, 2s, and 3s, so higher functioning, and GMFCS 4s and 5s, lower functioning. And then I also categorize people on the basis of obesity, and yes, I did this based on BMI, so having just listed all the reasons why I don't like BMI, it happens to be in the medical record, and so we used it for this standpoint in this particular study. So BMI of less than 30 and more than 30, so non-obese and obese. And you can see that, uh, that the best case scenario essentially is being in GMFCS 1s, 2s, or 3s and not obese, multimorbidity was 53.6% prevalent. The worst case scenario was individuals who were GMFCS 4s and 5s uh, and were obese approached 80% prevalent multimorbidity risk. So this is a really, it's not just a, a, a minimal problem. This is a very, very highly prevalent condition, a situation in the middle-aged adults with CP. So at that point, we had done nothing but cross-sectional work and started to really wonder if there was a way that we could leverage larger data to see if we could do some longitudinal modeling of health outcomes. And so um, luckily enough, we have great connections with some, with some data analysts at, um, IHP at IHBI here at University of Michigan. And we're able to build a cohorts of adults with CP using administrative data. Um, and what we wanted to know was, is there age-related effects of, uh, for cardiometabolic disease in adults with CP? It's really, there had only been one or two studies published on risk factors for cardiometabolic disease, but no longitudinal studies had been performed. And so a couple of years ago, we were able to publish this information and looked at basically age-related trends in cardiometabolic diseases in a fairly large sample uh, between the ages of, between the years 2000 and 2014 of privately insured individuals. So the, the, the inclusion criteria was that they had to have at least three years of continuous enrollment um, in a, from a single plan and have an index diagnosis of CP. And we had about 2,600 individuals, adults with CP, that fit the, the inclusion criteria. Um, and then you can see we examined longitudinal trends of diabetes, 
this is incident diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, cardiac dysrhythmia, and atherosclerosis, and then looked at the effect of age on each of these outcomes. And what we found was that the cumulative incidence of all the diseases uh, ranged between 6 and 34% at three plus years. And from 11.6 for diabetes, 34.4% uh, for hypercholesterolemia, almost 30% for hypertension, and 13.2% for cardiac dysrhythmia, and 6% for atherosclerosis. Notably, importantly, the three plus year cumulative incidence for hypercholesterolemia and hypertension are similar to what the lifetime risk would be. The lifetime risk would be. Um, for the non-CP general population. So it's, it's extremely, extremely highly uh, incident um, in, in our patient population and something that we should be very aware of. Um, you can see that age was also really important predictor. So the older individuals, the l shorter time to event for all outcomes, diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, cardiac dysrhythmia, atherosclerosis, um, <clears throat> so that led us again to go back to our clinical sample that we have available here at the University of Michigan to see if there is indeed actually a, 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 a signal for early aging from the standpoint of metabolic and chronic disease risk in the youngest adults with CP. So essentially, if there's going to be evidence for what we have been saying of early aging, we would expect to see something like the chronic diseases that are known to arise in older adulthood in younger adults, in the youngest adults. And so uh, we looked at non-communicable diseases and multimorbidity in young adults with CP. And we had about 450 adults with CP between the ages of 30 and then 448 with, with, without CP in our medical center that we compared to. And I won't read off the list, but essentially 13 non-communicable diseases were evaluated across the musculoskeletal system, cardiometabolic system, and pulmonary system. And what we found was that um, young adults with CP already see uh, uh, risk for these non-communicable diseases um, even before uh, age of uh, 30. So this bar graph simply shows a morbidity score. So adults with CP, uh, adults without CP are represented in white bar, and then adults with CP, everybody is, uh, any adult with CP is in the black bar. And so this is zero morbidity, which means that they have no chronic disease. And one would be they have one of the chronic diseases, two would be two, three, and then of course more greater than or four. And what we see is, and then the gray, and, uh, light gray and dark gray bars are GMFCS ones, twos, and threes, and GMFCS fours respectively. So adults with, uh, young adults with CP have um, much lower prevalence of having basically health. This is no, multi, mo no morbidity at all. Um, and then as you can see, the, the morbidity score goes up for adults with CP as compared to the young adults without CP. So very, very much a evidence of early aging from, the, from the, the context of chronic disease risk early in life. So is there evidence um, that that individuals with CP have psychological health disorders, mental health disorders, or morbidity. The reason why we started to look at this is that a lot of patients were coming into clinic and complaining, or we were hearing about parents who were concerned of individuals' um, uh, mental health outcomes being potentially something that they were concerned of, and yet uh, not many people were studying this in this population. There was some, there certainly have been studies on psychological depression, anxiety in children with CP, but nobody had really started to look at, um, aside from, you know, small clinic visits, but from a research context, how do individuals with CP experience mental health across the lifespan? And uh, just recently, uh, Dr. Dan Whitney published, led this paper, um, looking at prevalence of mental health disorders among uh, adults with CP. And essentially, we, we looked at across multiple categories of psychological health outcomes, including uh, schizophrenia, mood affective disorders, anxiety disorders, behavioral syndromes, uh, disorders of adult personality, behavior, and alcohol and opioid-related disorders, and found that adults with cerebral palsy had a significantly higher risk in odds of each of these categories. 
And we also found that adults with CP and uh, developmental disability, uh, which included autism spectrum disorder, epilepsy, and intel uh, intellectual disorders, had a higher, even higher risk for each of these outcomes. And so um, CP compared to general population without CP had much higher risk for mental health disorders, um, but CP with the neurodevelopmental disability um, uh, seemed to uh, uh, amplify that risk and had a higher uh, risk for each of the outcomes, both in men and women. So after that was published about a week ago, two weeks ago, I received this email. So I saw your article on depression and CP. I have a 24 year old son with mild CP, depression, anxiety, and insomnia. I'm looking for someone who is knowledgeable in all these fields who can help. I've called all over the country, but there are very few resources for adults and no one knows any psychiatrist who specializes on CP. Any insight you could provide would be helpful. The reason why I included this email is it, it really struck a chord with me because you could take out the, the depression anxiety piece and plug in any of these other conditions that we've been talking about and the same thing could be said. We have not done a good job of, of raising awareness um, around these issues in adults with CP and other uh, disabilities. Um, so I think it's extremely important that we use some of the information that we've gained from our research um, to not just improve public awareness, but also you know, clinical awareness of these outcomes for their patients when they're coming to clinic. The last study that I'm going to highlight is one that we just finished and is, is actually just being sent out for review, is we wanted to look at longitudinal psychological morbidity and cerebral palsy and spina bifida. Um, and so as a part of the ideal RRTC, we have begun to look at congenital disabilities across the lifespan, acquired disabilities, um, and progressive disabilities. And the, the congenital disabilities that we chose were cerebral palsy and spina bifida. And so the objective of this study was to compare incidents and adjusted hazards for psychological morbidity in adults living with and without CP or spina bifida. Um, we have a cohort of 15,000, just over 15,000 adults with cerebral palsy or spina bifida, and then a control cohort, a 20% uh, convenient sample of individuals who are privately insured, just about 2 million. And we wanted to know what the four-year incidence estimates and hazard ratios of common psychological morbidities that come from adults who are privately insured in the United States. And this is a busy slide, but this is essentially an incidence of each of these outcomes. And so at the top, we have any psychological morbidity, and then you can see below insomnia, adjustment disorders, anxiety disorders, PTSD, mood disorders, personality disorders, and so on and so forth. And then lastly, centralized pain. And what we found that adults with cerebral palsy or spina bifida were significantly higher risk for developing these in a four-year time horizon than individuals who did not have CP, spina bifida, or any other neurologic disease. And so um, it really stands to reason that we should be very, very, very keen to look at psychological health or screening for psychological health in our populations that we see over time. And even after adjusting for essentially everything that could account for psychological morbidity, so including demographic variables, um, comorbidity index, education, and income. On the far right model four, uh, the, ha the hazard ratios for each of these is extremely significant. They're very, very, very in high increased hazard for all but alcohol-related disorders in our adults with CP and spina bifida. And so um, it's, it's really important that we begin to think about not just what goes on below the neck, but also the, the psychological health of our populations. Um, there's lots of papers that are ongoing uh, collaboration across both domestic and international colleagues um, for us here at Michigan, but I, I wanted to put this into the slides so that you could, you could pull these, uh, these papers if you're interested. Um, and then uh, tons of work going on outside of our, our group that uh, is being worked on uh, both, again, both domestically and um, internationally that I wanted to make sure that if you haven't seen these papers, please take a look. They're, they're outstanding uh, pieces of work and also evidence that there is good work being done now on adults with CP or lifespan healthcare um, for individuals with CP. So if you wanna take a look at those, I, I provided the, the titles. So future directions, we must extend work to understand aging trajectories of other non-communicable diseases, including but not limited to, to cancer. Uh, Dr. Whitney is doing a lot of great work on CKD. Um, 
also hypogonadism, frailty and fracture, chronic pain phenotyping, uh, polypharmacy, and then of course sarcopenia and osteoporosis progression, ways that we can prevent those or, or um, stall that progression. So quickly, I have very, very little time. Points of intervention, um, I would direct you to um, a, a recently published recommendation for exercise for individuals with CP. And we have created um, a fact sheet, which is available through American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine, which is free to download from their website. Um, I, I want to point out the, the real importance between distinguishing between exercise physiology and sedentary physiology. Many individuals with CP not only don't do any exercise, but they consume very high volumes of sedentary behavior. So it's extremely important that we not just message that people need to exercise more, but they also need to fragment sedentary behavior. And um, this slide shows a meta-analysis that we combined in that uh, recommendation that shows basically sedentary behavior as determined by accelerometry is most of the day, right? This is, if, if, if you look at a per percentage, GMFCS ones even, um, most of the day is being, is consumed with sedentariness. Very little light physical activity and moderate to vigorous physical activity. So if, if I'm looking at this information, as much as I want to advocate for increasing moderate to vigorous physical activity as an exercise physiologist, I have to say we got to start here. We have to start with changing sedentary behavior. So this is the, Dr. Hoppala again. So now after we go through all the research, um, the question is how do we distill all of this information into something that you can take to your primary care provider, to your healthcare practitioner, um, and discuss it within the confines of a relatively short office visit with a doctor. Because there's a lot that we've learned about and it's, there's a lot of information to think about and a lot to get concerned about and how do you take that and do something about it, especially in the area of where we have um, very many practitioners that know very little about aging with a disability. So first of all, I think it is very important to have a primary care provider. If nothing else, they will do a baseline assessment and age-appropriate screenings per national guidelines for all adults, and this is key. If you don't have a primary care provider as, a, as anyone, but especially adult with a disability, that's the first thing. The, the piece to add is to review with your primary care doctor specific health issues that may need additional evaluation due to your disability. Specialty care, there are several palsy specialists is usually not a primary care provider. They can provide specific care related to CP or other health issues, specifically as relates to mobility. But, and they can also communicate recommendations with you and with your primary care practitioner, especially for things that maybe at higher risk if you have a developmental disability or mobility impairments. And they can provide some guidance for health conditions that need more evaluation. So some of the things that you can, that we should be addressed were activity recommendations, risk assessment for certain diseases such as heart disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, and mental health issues. Also pain and arthritis, some assessment of activity and sleep and nutrition should be covered. And I'll go over a couple of these in a little more detail. So some of the things to think about when you're seeing your doctor is we saw a lot about the problems with high cholesterol, diabetes, heart disease, all of those are very common. So some of the things to bring to your doctor would be to talk about your family history, your medical active history, your medical history, and your activity level. We know that sitting still for long periods of time is very bad that's another risk to, that can be brought up your doctor should do basic vital signs blood pressure height and weight the one thing that would probably be helpful to add that many primary care doctors or even specialists do not do is a waist circumference this is a measurement around your waist and you may need to have to ask this done to have this done um, adding in a waist circumference will give additional information there are standard cutoffs for the general population and if you're above those cutoffs even if you have a normal body mass index or that weight to height ratio, we know that there's higher risk for certain things. 
You may need to screen earlier with certain labs for diabetes or cholesterol if you have uh, additional risk factors, which as we saw most, many people with cerebral palsy do. The other important area of concern is bone health. Many of our, many people with cerebral palsy have limited mobility and have difficulty walking or can't walk at all. And this is, um, puts them at risk for having low bone density. So including assessment of function, do you walk? Do you do any physical activity? Uh, do you do any weight bearing activity? Um, what about your calcium and vitamin D intake? Those are questions that um, help to assess your risk for um, low bone density. If you have any history of broken bones, that is also important to bring to your physician as some of those fractures might put you at higher risk for having, might be an indicator of low bone density. You may benefit from advanced screening, including bone density per your specialist or primary care doctor. And treatment for osteoporosis, if you do have low bone density, is best done with a specialist who understands individuals with mobility impairments. So some of the lifestyle changes, activity recommendations, Dr. Peterson brought up some of his paper. And to briefly summarize some of the recommendations that in that paper are increase your activity over time to help maintain a healthy weight. Weight bearing is important to maintain muscle and bone and encouraging activity can help with gradually transitioning to a less sedentary lifestyle. So the, the less you sit still, the more you do even a little bit of movement, the better. You can start small and gradually build any activity. Even a couple of minutes every hour is better than nothing. Sleep is also very important. There are some more papers coming out about sleep. Adequate sleep is very important for overall health. And it's also very important uh, for pain management when we start to see evidence with um, problems with pain and fatigue for people with cerebral palsy. Sleep disorders are also common. So you may need to talk to your primary care doctor about sleep and to decide if you have any problems with sleep, such as sleep apnea that need a sleep study. As far as nutrition, Again, healthy nutrition is important. There are not really any recommendations at this point in time specific to cerebral palsy, but it's important to consider the research such as weight and body mass guidelines for the general population may not be as applicable. So you'll have to think about a healthy weight uh, in a little bit different way versus what we recommend for the typical population. So in, sum, in summary, individuals with cerebral palsy are at higher risk for many health conditions, including cardiovascular disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, and low bone density. Factors that would make this uh, a higher risk are low activity, low muscle mass, and extra fat mass. Adding measurements of waist circumference to your body mass index measurement can help with, help with assessing risk. Discuss your issues with your primary care doctor and consider screening earlier if you have some of these factors that we talked about. An important addition is to include psychological assessments or discussion of uh, mental health issues with your, with your uh, doctor. As far as activity, the most important to thing to think about is that muscle is protective. The, the more muscle you have, the better it is for you to do for your overall health as you age. So decreasing the amount of time that you're sitting or being sedentary, which means not moving, by adding in short amounts of movement frequently is your first step. Any weight bearing that you can do, even if it's supported weight bearing, depending on your functional level, to help with strengthening and bone health is going to also be protective. And then slowly progress to short bursts of exercise and making sure at, all, at the same time to have adequate sleep and nutrition. So we'd like to acknowledge uh, a lot of colleagues, obviously uh, our department chairman who has been very supportive, Dr. Edward Hurwitz, who has um, really been an incredible mentor for me and probably also Dr. Apola, uh, and really is a pioneer and leader in this field. Obviously Dr. Michelle Mead, who's the PI of this grant and also extremely, extremely valuable as a mentor. And you can see the list of, of folks. I'm not going to go through everybody, but we I owe a lot of gratitude to a lot of colleagues. And obviously, we want to acknowledge our funding. Um, and I think we have 
a sufficient amount of time. Oh, Heidi, can you cl click forward? We want to provide our email addresses. Hopefully that's okay with you, Heidi. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. If you have specific questions that you think of after the, the webinar is over um, that you didn't submit, please feel free to email me. Um, I won't speak for Dr. Hapala, but you can certainly email me and I, I'd, love to, I'd love to be able to continue the conversation after. Uh, but I do think that we have still a little bit of time for, for questions. And just uh, one other thing that tomorrow or in a day or two, you will be sent around an evaluation link, which will be another opportunity to provide, ask more questions, ask for follow-up. That will also have the website for the RRTC, um, which will be have both this uh, webinar as well as other resources and material that may be of helpful help to you. And with that, um, I believe that Dory and Jenny have been gathering questions. And so if they want to go back, um, maybe you can go back to the final recommendation slide that you had put ready. But let's uh, hear some of the questions that must have been uh, being come up with this wealth of information that we've gotten from uh, Dr. Happel and Dr. Peterson. Thank you, Mark and Heidi, again for the presentation. Um, as a reminder to those listening, um, we will be sending out that copy of the webinar recording, the slides, and that feedback survey um, in the next day or two after the webinar. Um, and we will send out that longer summary and tips later. Um, we have had several questions from the audience. Um, we are going to get through as many as we can now. Um, if there are questions that we don't get through, we will address them um, in, in some of the follow-up emails that we'll provide in the next couple of weeks. Um, so the first question uh, from our audience was um, if we could briefly differentiate the indicators of cerebral palsy versus multiple sclerosis. So cerebral palsy is a condition that is occurs at or around the time of birth. So multiple sclerosis is an adult onset condition. There are similar issues that people with cerebral palsy and multiple sclerosis can face, including like muscle spasticity and uh, difficulties with mobility. But it, one of them is an adult onset disability that is quite variable and the other one is uh, childhood onset. Thank you. Um, we also had somebody who asked a question about what the, is the physiological reason for why spasticity increases during the aging process for people with CP? So we think some of the reasons that spasticity worsens is as muscles are, get weak, sometimes they also get tighter and more spastic. One of the best things that I often recommend to patients as part of their spasticity treatment is uh, strengthening uh, often done first in conjunction with a physical therapist as it needs to be done under a controlled setting to start. But I've had very good results uh, for some of my patients if they're able to do strengthening uh, to do that with physical therapy. So that may be one of the main reasons. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Um, and if you were the person who asked in a question box and you have a clarification, please feel free to, to ask that again as a question and we'll make sure that the questions get to the ideal RRTC and the, um, the presenters. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on because we have many more questions. Um, we had a question from a person who says they work out regularly, but they lost muscle mass due to a delayed C-spine stenosis diagnosis. Um, and they said, will this mass return with protein and exercise? It's difficult to answer without seeing somebody, but we do know that rehabilitation uh, and physical therapy can help build strength again after an injury. I think some of the most difficult things is with cerebral palsy is once you lose function or are down for surgery, many of my patients have a hard time um, building their strength back up and it takes longer. But I definitely seeing that um, with with time and the appropriate rest not overdoing it also building strength is possible and I, I don't know. yeah and I and I would just add to that that physical activity in general is extremely important for all populations but especially for individuals with CP um, during the aging process 
Um, we, we know that strengthening exercise, so doing resistance training is not just beneficial for preservation of muscle strength and muscle hypertrophy, which is size of muscle or muscle mass, but it also has a really potent metabolic stimulus to the muscle as well. And so for those individuals who either can't or don't want to do repetitive aerobic physical activity, string training is, it really is a very, very, very powerful uh, modality of exercise that can lead to very a vast array of improved uh, health outcomes, not just function. So often people will talk about the functional ramifications of cerebral palsy and how strength training can help with improving function. But uh, again, as a physiologist, I, I really would like to also posit that strength training is very important for metabolic health. Um, the muscle organ system is the largest organ in our bodies. And if we think about it like that, and we can stimulate it directly doing strength training, we could probably have the most potent benefit so long as an individual also has a healthy uh, body mass. Um, <clears throat> it's a really potent stimulus to improve metabolic health of the, of the overall system. So strength training can certainly serve all purposes in that regard. Thank you. Um, we had a question about the research. Um, one of the viewers noted that it seems like a lot of the research was focusing on privately insured patients in the studies, um, and they were asking why that was, um, and then noted that a large percentage of people with disabilities have only Medicaid or Medicare. Yeah, so it's a really, actually a really good question and one that I was hoping that somebody might ask. So because of the limitations for or the constraints for the webinar, we didn't have a lot of time to dive into each of the individual studies. Um, uh, first, we are currently working on several studies using both Medicare and Medicaid data, um, but our original funding was to look at privately insured individuals, um, and so that's how we started our work. Um, the MEPS work that I originally published is, is publicly available, and it's all individuals, whether or not they have um, any kind of insurance. Um, and so the, the most recent studies in the last three years have all been privately insured. And so one could assume that if you're studying individuals who have private insurance, they may or may not be, but they may be higher functioning, healthier segments of the population. May not be, but we have to, we have to start looking at that um, in, in real earnest. And that's, that's something that we're currently working on so that we can, we can bolster the population representativeness of our, of our research. And I think just to add to that, the idea that often uh, with the Medicare and Medicaid, population, they have less resources in general. And so when we begin to think about the limitations of just using uh, a private insurance sample, you probably think that those are individuals who are healthier, that they may have access to better nutrition, more financial resources or education as associated with that. And that the outcomes when we when the research is done with the Medicaid population and Medicare will likely show even greater extent of chronic conditions. Yeah, so so our, in other words, our estimates may be conservative, uh, frankly. They may be very conservative estimates. Thank you. Um, we also got a question where people say that the recommendations are great, um, but they, they know that there appears to be a shortage of CP knowledgeable providers. Have you given thought on how to build capacity for physicians um, to be more knowledgeable on this front? I think this is an ongoing issue with, in fact, providers um, working with individuals with developmental disabilities, beyond pediatric providers, individuals um, generally who are comfortable working with individuals with disabilities out of specialty areas. And so this is, I think, an ongoing uh, focus both of the RRTC and where the field in general needs to go. We want to enhance knowledge across um, the continuum. Um, these are factors that are integrated into the Affordable Care Act, but I, I think they're just beginning to get in, um, enacted. Uh, in the future, we hope to have uh, CE courses that are direct um, to providers. Also programs like the, the LEN program in which providers get training and experience working with individuals with CP are important, but uh, currently are threatened by federal budget cuts. And so while there are now more um, 
awareness of the importance of education and capacity building for healthcare providers. There's also threats um, to the actual enactment of those processes. And I don't know if Heidi, you what you've seen in the field in terms of this, some of these issues. Yeah, I think it's a valid concern. I do feel like um, med peds providers, so uh, physicians who are trained in both internal medicine and pediatrics are often the most open and least uh, affected or worried about somebody not knowing what to do with somebody with a disability because they are more familiar taking care of children with um, chronic health conditions and as they transition into adulthood. So sometimes I make recommendations for my patients to look for like an internist uh, who also has a pediatric background, like a med peds person. But yes, it is a an area where we still have a lot of work to do. Yeah, I, I just to follow up with that, I I think that raising awareness, not just to our own choir of of of, of people who work in you know rehab populations, um, our physician colleagues, our researchers, other researchers, raising awareness in that audience is one thing. We have to raise awareness, pub both public awareness and clinical awareness of people who do not necessarily always see uh, patients uh, who have cerebral palsy. So that's really important. And I think also that has some impact on potentially public policy uh, and healthcare infrastructure for people with CP across the lifespan. I recently got a review from a journal <clears throat> that said, why are you studying adults with CP? This is a pediatric condition. So to me, there's a really huge disconnect between um, you know what we're what we're doing and trying to accomplish, and what a lot of people are doing out there. So uh, I think it, public awareness needs to be improved, clinical awareness needs to be include, improved, and that will that will really bolster I think the healthcare infrastructure for people with CP in the future. Thank you so much. Um, we had uh, a couple questions around people who who for reasons of you know access to to doctors or, or not really finding um a very knowledgeable doctor um have may have fallen out of the practice of going to the doctor or may resist um going to a doctor to address any concerns they have as they as they age do you have any recommendations um that you want to offer around this i think just trying to get in to find get recommendations from family members if they are a good primary if you all need a primary care doctor first and trying to find um, somebody who will at least listen to you and who you feel comfortable talking to is the first step I think if you can communicate with your physician and they're open you, that will make the biggest difference and I've heard that in working with other uh, individuals with other disabilities that sometimes it's um, finding a primary care provider, a healthcare provider who will learn, even if they don't have that base knowledge. There are other expertise they can find um, if they're willing to listen. But there is a concern by uh, folks about how much time the healthcare providers may need to invest to get up to speed. So sometimes other um, ancillary. Uh, providers and nurse clinicians, physician assistant, assistants may have more time to establish the relationship, um, listen to everything that's going on, and then partner with the physician uh, to find the appropriate treatment. And one of the things I wanted to just bring up is we do have a handout with some resources that will be sent out. With the evaluation survey. Mm -hmm. And so that would be another um, resource that patients can bring to some of their providers as far as there's fact sheets like that are one to three pages long with uh, summaries for certain conditions and there are links to some of those and that may be a, a good place to start the conversation. I think we're just about out of time with this webinar but once again we hope that um, we've raised your awareness about the wealth of um, challenges and that are out there that wealth of research going on in this topic and um, encourage you to continue to advocate for ongoing attention um, to issues of aging for individuals with cerebral palsy about the need for interventions, practical advice, and training for healthcare providers. Um, we welcome your feedback both on the survey and through email um, and look forward to continued conversation from this about this area.
Thank you so much to all of the presenters. Um, thank you to Mark and Heidi um, for sharing their work, tips, and answering questions today. Um, and thank you on behalf of everybody at the Ideal RRTC and the University of Michigan for attending the webinar today. Um, we hope we will see you all soon on our next webinar, um, and we hope you have a wonderful day.